Welcome to the Gay Buddhist Forum, where teachers from all schools of Buddhism offer their perspectives on the Dharma and its application in modern times, especially for LGBTQI audiences. These talks are offered freely to the world and made possible by appreciative listeners. If you would like to support our efforts to share the Dharma with underserved audiences, please visit gaybuddhist.org. There you can donate, find a list of upcoming speakers, or enjoy many hundreds of these recorded talks dating back to 1996. Suzuki Roshi, a longtime environmental and social justice activist. He is a retired eco psychologist and former mayor of Sebastopol. He serves on the board of directors of the Center for Climate Protection and the board of trustees of Meriden University. His large and foolish project, in the words of Rumi, is to restore the soul of the world through reawakening the oral tradition of poetry. He is also the founder and producer of Rumi's Caravan. Welcome, Larry. Thank you, George. Great pleasure to be with all of you here again this morning. Um, I recognize some of your faces from previous times. Um, just sitting in this space with you all feels so... Um, so wonderful. I mean, the silence, the um, sense of peace, the love here, it's palpable. So I, it's a great privilege to be here. And to bring my sweetheart, Cynthia, with me this morning is also a great treat. You know, in, um, in the Mahayana tradition, the Zen uh, and Tibetan traditions, the, the goal of our practice is not nirvana. It's not to get off the wheel. Um, but it is really to embody and awaken bodhicitta, the, the awakened mind. And the vow is to live with and for all beings and to participate joyfully in the suffering of the world. And I think we're all increasingly aware of the suffering in our world, the suffering of this world. And so what's a constant practice for me is to open my heart to that suffering and not be overwhelmed by it to the point that I'm incapacitated. So how to do that, how to participate, participate joyfully in the suffering of the world is what I want to talk about today. And am I speaking loud enough? Is that? Okay. <clears throat> Pardon? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 
All right. Raise your hand if you can't hear me out enough. My voice. Okay. Um, so Buddha spoke about the three characteristics of existence: impermanence, emptiness, and no self. Now these are really um, different aspects of the same thing, and the. Um, the Lotus Sutra really speaks about emptiness and what, what it, the essence of that message is form is emptiness, emptiness is form. There is no difference between form and emptiness. And yet we live in the world of form, the world of um, samsara, where things appear to be real and they are real and yet we also live in the realm of the formless. So our work is to bridge those worlds, to live in both those worlds simultaneously without separating them. And what emptiness really means is not that there is nothing here, nothing there's nothing here, nothing there, nothing here, but there is nothing that is separate from everything else. The essence of the Lotus Sutra is the understanding that everything in this universe, everything in us, every one of us is absolutely interdependent, interbeing with everything else. That our every suffering in this world arises from this mistaken belief in our own separateness. And so the key to the par joyful participation is understanding and seeing clearly this false belief in our separateness, which is where we, the no-self notion comes in when we really examine our own process as we sit in meditation and indeed as we interact in the world, if we're truly honest with ourselves, we find that there is nothing in us that is permanent, nothing in us that is not connected to everything else. And the notion of impermanence is the reminder that everything is in constant flow, in constant flux. These flowers may appear to be permanent, but we know that yesterday they were growing from the earth, and tomorrow they will be composting back into the earth. And this is the same with us. And when we understand the impermanence of each of us, how can we not open our hearts to each other to see how temporary each of us is here and how temporary all of our complaints and successes and um, issues are. We're just passing through and yet we are the wave passing through the ocean and we are the ocean. It's all of that simultaneously. So Dogen, the great Zen teacher, um, says that to study the Buddha way is to study the self. To study the self is to forget the self. To forget the self is to be awakened into the 10,000 things by which he means that our real liberation is in remembering that we are this ocean of existence. And one of the great um, Brahma Viharas, which I've spoken about here before, the, the Brahma Viharas are the great, the great virtues. There's um, compassion, loving kindness, sympathetic joy and equanimity, upekka. And so it's upekka that I really want to speak about today. 
um, equanimity. And how do we cultivate equanimity? It's by remembering the transitoriness, the impermanence of everything. One of my favorite koans that I've been working with or has been working with me for several years is this precious jade teacup is already broken. And in my um, work in the world, which um, mostly has to do with climate change and developing public policies to do what we can to avert the worst disasters that are coming down the pipe from climate chaos. Um, sometimes I, I get overwhelmed by the magnitude of the challenge with the denial, the denial that lives in me all the time, and the denial and um, almost malicious denial that we see coming from Washington these days. So, um, this, this koan that I spoke of, this precious deep jade teacup already being broken, reminds me that it's already happened. My death is a given. Everyone we know and love is already in the process of dying. So, we can give up trying to prevent that from happening, trying to um, hold off the reality, and in that find the courage to embrace the suffering, to lean into it, and do what we can to ease the suffering that's right in front of us. I was recently in... Uh, in Laos, in the old capital of Luang Prabang, which is a beautiful old city on the Mekong River. And there is a tradition there every morning along the main street. Along the main street of the town, there are six or seven temples and monasteries. And every morning at dawn, the monks come out with their begging bowls, and the members of the community line up to make offerings to these bowls and to these monks. And by doing so, accrue merit. And I had a, one of those moments of um, and minor momentary enlightenments where you, know, you see the figure ground shift and I realized that they were not begging for their daily meal. This was a practice of gratefully receiving whatever is being offered. And at that moment I, I realized that this is what my practice needs to be at this time, which is to gratefully receive whatever is coming my way. The collapse of the ecosystem, my own mortality, my wife's eventual death, the loss of everything I love, to welcome that. At the same time, I'm welcoming the sustenance and the beauty and the joy and the love that is coming. And holding that all is the work. And it may seem like a paradox, like a contradiction, but Carl Jung once said that emotional maturity is not about resolving the paradoxes of the conflicts, but growing large enough to contain them all. And this is what the Lotus Sutra also speaks about, form and emptiness, embracing, embracing it all. One of my favorite poems it's by Jack Gilbert, called A Brief for the Defense. He says, Sorrow everywhere, slaughter everywhere. If babies aren't starving someplace, 
they are starving somewhere else with flies in their nostrils. But we enjoy our lives because that is what God wants. Otherwise, the morning before summer's dawn would not be made so fine. The Bengal tiger would not be fashioned so miraculously well. The poor women at the fountain are laughing together between the suffering they have known and the awfulness in their future. They are smiling and laughing while someone in the village is very sick. There is laughter every day in the terrible streets of Calcutta, and the women laugh in the cages of Bombay. If we deny our happiness, resist our satisfaction, we lessen the significance of their deprivation. We must risk delight. We can do without pleasure, but not delight, not enjoyment. We must have the stubbornness to embrace our gladness in the ruthless furnace of this world, to make injustice the sole measure of our attention is to praise the devil. If the locomotive of the Lord runs us down, we should give thanks that the end had magnitude. <laughs> we must admit that there will be laughter and music despite everything. We stand at the prow again of a small ship, anchored late at night in the tiny harbor, looking over to the sleeping island. The waterfront is three shuttered cafes and a single naked lamp burning. To hear the sound of oars in the silence as a rowboat comes slowly out and then goes back is truly worth all the years of sorrow that are to come. And one of the things that I love about this poem is it reminds us of our responsibility to participate joyfully. Because when we bring happiness and joy into the world, we add to the sum total of happiness in the world. Happiness is not a zero-sum proposition. Your happiness does not diminish mine. It adds to it. This is the practice of mudita, of sympathetic joy. When we take joy in someone else's happiness, we are also adding to the happiness in the world and relieving the suffering in the world. This is one, this is part of the bodhisattva practice. So participating joyfully is truly a spiritual and ethical and moral responsibility for us to cultivate that joy. And at the same time to accept receive, understand, and see clearly the suffering around us, and wherever we see it, to act to relieve that suffering. Shantideva, one of the great um, Buddhist sages, once said that the source of all misery in the world is seeking one seeking happiness for oneself and the source of all happiness is seeking the happiness of others when we seek happiness for ourselves what we're actually doing is reifying this illusion of our own separateness And it's that illusion of our separateness. I mean, it's that the illusion of separateness is the Buddha's definition of ego. That illusion of separateness leads us to grasp what we think will make us happy and push away what we think will make us unhappy. So the practice of upekka, of receiving 
with open hands and open heart, whatever is coming our way, is the practice of happiness. We have our opinions of what is good and what is bad. But when we really think about it, we realize that those, that we really don't know enough to know whether the ultimate outcome of something is going to be good or bad, desirable or undesirable. There's an old story, an uh, old Chinese story of a peasant who has acquired this magnificent horse that is the envy of all his neighbors. And they all say, oh, what a fortunate man you are to own such a magnificent horse. He says, maybe. Well, then one day, the horse runs away. And the neighbors say, oh, how unfortunate to have lost your horse. He says, maybe. Well, then one day, the horse comes back leading a whole herd of wild horses into the man's corral. And the neighbors say, oh, how fortunate you are. And he says, maybe. <laughs> well, one day, the man's son is trying to break one of the wild horses. He's thrown and breaks his legs. And the neighbors say, oh, how unfortunate. Maybe. Well, then the king's soldiers come to draft all the young men in the village and send them off to war. <laughs> They can't take his son because his leg is broken. The neighbors say, oh, how fortunate you are. <laughs> Maybe. And there is no end to the story. It goes on and on. And that's the end of all of our stories. There is no end. Maybe. Good fortune? Bad fortune? Who are we to know? We have our opinions. I, that's all they are. The third Zen patriarch, Wei Nong, once said that the great way is very simple. Merely cease to cherish opinions. <laughs> we can't help having them. You know, opinions are like assholes. Everybody's got one, or multiple ones. But we don't have to hold on to them. Recognize that it's just your opinion. There is liberation. There is freedom. And in letting go of our expectations of what has to happen, what ought to happen for us to be happy, we loosen our grip. And loosening our grip is the way to happiness. You know, the second noble truth is that the source of suffering is grasping what is, trying to make permanent what is impermanent and always changing and flowing away, trying to hold on to that, or pushing away what is coming our way. The Buddha way is to get out of the way and just be the way. And receive whatever it is with gratitude. This city is named after St. Francis of Assisi. And the practice that he taught was the practice of gratitude. He said, well, in Latin, the word gratias means both gratitude and grace. And he said, it's the same thing. You know, the definition of grace is unearned, undeserved, unanticipated comfort and blessings coming to us. And he likened it to putting an umbrella over your head when blessings are coming into our lives. We hold up this umbrella and then we feel deprived. 
So he said that the practice of gratitude is how we take down that umbrella and receive the blessings. Gratitude is saying, thank you. And then our thank you is what opens that channel for blessings to come to us. So th saying thank you when love is coming our way or beauty or something delicious or something we wanted, it's easy to say thank you when the things that we want are coming our way. The challenge is to say thank you when it's the hard stuff. So here's a poem by W.S. Merwin, um, former poet laureate of the U.S. Um, he died last year. Last um, month. Pardon? Last month. Last month, yeah. Um, this, this is a graduate course in um, gratitude. He says, listen, with the night falling, we are saying thank you. We are stopping on the bridge to bow from the railings and say thank you. We are running out of the glass rooms, our mouths full of food to say thank you. We are standing at the edge of the water, back from a mugging, back from a hospital, back from a funeral, back from news of the dead, whether we knew them or not, we are saying thank you. In a culture up to its chin in shame and living in the stench it has chosen, we are saying thank you. Over telephones, we are saying thank you, and in the backs of cars, and in elevators. Remembering wars, and police at the back door, and beatings on the stairs, we are saying thank you. In the banks that use us, we are saying thank you. With the crooks in office and the rich and fashionable unchanged, we go on saying thank you, thank you. With the animals dying around us, our lost feelings, we are saying thank you. With the words going out like the cells of the brain and the cities growing over us like the earth, we are saying thank you. With the forests falling faster than the minutes of our lives, we are saying thank you. We are saying thank you faster and faster. With nobody listening, we are saying thank you. We are saying thank you and waving, dark though it is. So here is a challenge. How do we say thank you when everything in us says, no, I don't want this? Remember the peasant and his horse. When we say, the results of this election are leading to disaster. I remind myself. The results of the 2016 election in this country led to a reawakening of commitment and vision and passion by a generation that had given up on politics. I don't know how things are going to unfold with the next one, or the one after that, but I know that there is something arising that will not be denied. William Stafford, another wonderful poet, says, it could happen any time. Earthquake, Armageddon, tornado, it could happen. Or sunshine, love, salvation. It could, you know. That's why we wake and look out. No guarantees in this life, but some bonuses, like morning, like noon, like right now, like evening. 
So remembering the impermanence. The good passes, the bad passes. Our opinions come and go like the thoughts in our head. So we don't have to hold on to them. But we can still trust that the impulse in us to kindness comes from this deepest truth of our absolute interconnectedness and interdependence on each other and remembering how ephemeral all of our lives are. Here's one of my poems. In these awe-filled days of fire and flood, we watch and wait and wonder when that fierce hand will reach for us at last. Those of us not yet touched by calamity quake, knowing in our bones that though we may be spared this time, time will level us all. No magic amulets, no prayers, good deeds, or good looks can provide protection from our terminal human condition. And those of us who have watched a child swept forever from our arms or fled the flames that swallowed our hopes and our memories or hid from the bombs or the predator's gaze know now that nothing will ever be the same as if anything ever were the same. For we all are falling like ashes, like rain, like petals, like leaves, but we are all falling together. And if we can know in truth that there is nowhere to land, tell me, could we know the difference between falling and flying? So when we recognize that we are all falling and none of us knows who we are or what we're doing. How can we not open our hearts of compassion to everyone, even those that don't wish us well? Because we know that they are creating their own hell and they will continue to suffer for that. Whereas if we open our hearts, we are creating heaven for us and those around us. So compassion is what arises in us naturally as we awaken. When somebody asked the Dalai Lama to describe his religion, he said simply, kindness. So I'm going to leave you with one final poem with that title by Naomi Shihab Nye. To know the true meaning of kindness, you must lose things. Feel the future dissolve in a moment like salt in a weakened broth. What you held in your hand, what you counted and carefully saved, all that must go so you know how great the desolate landscape can be between the regions of kindness. How you ride and ride, thinking the bus will never stop. The passengers eating maize and chicken will stare out the window forever. Before you can know the tender gravity of kindness, you must travel where the Indian in a white poncho lies dead by the side of the road. You must see how this could be you. How he too was someone who journeyed through the night with the plans and the simple breath that kept him alive. Before you can know kindness as the deepest thing inside, you must know sorrow as the other deepest thing. You must wake up with sorrow. You must speak with it until your tongue grips the thread of all sorrows and you see the full size of the cloth. 
then you know it is only kindness that means anything anymore. Only kindness that sends you out to purchase bread and mail letters. Only kindness that lifts its head from the crowd of the world to say, it is I you have been looking for all your life, and then goes with you everywhere, like a shadow or a friend. Thank you for your kind attention. And I think we have time for any questions or comments, if you have any. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, Thank you. There's, you know, it's always a. Um, I think you really, for me, you really gracefully um, held the that you know the joy and the laughter of equanimity and bringing in the compassion to me. Um, helps temper the absolution of responsibility. I get concerned in our spiritual communities of talking about equanimity and losing sight. Of, it's easy to relieve ourselves of the urgency to act. Um, it's It can be easily like, oh, <laughs> Cool. I don't have to do, you know, and we're not all called to act, and it's not all of our roles. Um, but I do think that the more you see, there might be more responsibility too. And so, yes. um, but you know, I like thinking, talking about compassion gives us that like space to step into then that you know. Yes, and we don't have to figure out some elaborate plan for what to do. When you see someone in pain, maybe you can't set their broken bone, or maybe you can, but you can also just say, hello, friend, I see you. Yeah, or, you know, fighting for climate justice when you know that there's nothing to really be done. I mean, that was, I mean, how do you... You well, actually, so there cool. are a lot of things to be done, <laughs> but we can't but, do but, it all. But, but the, there's the, in a sense, there's also like the why, you know, when you're holding the broken cup already, accept it. Accept it. And we can sit in peace with ourselves and the, the, the world as it crumbles around us and suffering around <coughs> us and be at ease with that. So why, why do you do it then? Ah, because things can always get worse. <laughs> well, they, but, they, but they will. Things will get worse, yeah. yes. So, for, for and, you, so where, where do you find that for yourself? Because to step into the place that needs the love yeah. is what um, is in our nature to do as human beings. Um, to see um, to see suffering arising, and to see. Um, where you can have some impact is the call to action. We can't make, none of us can make the difference, but each of us can make a difference. Here, here's another poem that addresses that. <laughs> Ecclesiastes says, for everything there is a season. And you say, but it's tax season, it's allergy season, it's baseball season. And I've got to season the steak and the barbie. Besides, I don't have time to change the world. Goethe tells us that the genius, the power, and the magic in boldness. And you say, but what difference could I make anyway? The foxes are guarding the hen house. The juggernaut's out of control. We're all just snowflakes in the wind. 
Earth. <laughs> the mountain axe, which snowflake falling, will be the one to send down the avalanche, changing this entire landscape. That's why I do it. Is that him? Thank you. Oh, yeah. I, mean, I know. I know, too. Yeah. I just, yeah. Over here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I know you get that. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just a comment, something that's coming to my mind, we're talking about this interconnectedness, and, you know, and then you're, and I wrote this thing about that a lot lately, and, and participating in that <coughs> dynamic and experiencing an awareness of that. And one of the things that I have noticed is that when I focus on something for me, or a disappointment, or I'm resisting something that I see and I don't like, I, I, I feel a clenching and a resistance yes. within. It yeah. creates a separation from being able to experience, and not with any specific objective of exactly what is the next step forward. I find that if I can just focus on unclenching, it comes, it comes back, and I know what I'm supposed to. It's not like that. That's beautifully put. Yes. You unquench and you lean into the suffering and the next step shows itself. And you actually fall into that next step, which is how we walk anyway. We fall and fall and fall. Yeah. That's, mm -hmm. Just one more part of yeah. that. If I don't clench, the clenching precipitates a downward cascading of negativity all the time. Yes. Yeah. Beautifully said. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, along similar lines, um, where does your experience being a mayor fall into this Buddhist um, <laughs> discussion? <laughs> the call to participate in the suffering in the world and in politics, um, as an as a shy introvert, <clears throat> it's it was very painful. For me, I, for, I spent 12 years in elected office, and it was very painful, but it felt like it was my dharma to do that, to work on protecting the environment, to provide um, affordable housing, to um, try to introduce kindness and beauty into political discourse. I don't know how successful I was. Well, that, those 12 years, where did they fit in terms of your Buddhist development? Um, let's see. Um, I was first elected in 1998. So, it was, I mean, I'd been practicing for 30 years before then. But um, it's, in a way my Buddhist practice led me inevitably into doing it and and then out of it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you. But, but it, it was a tremendous opportunity to practice because there was constant conflict and um, anger directed at me. Um, and so one of the practices... Um, that was very helpful for me. Helpful for me was a Tibetan Vajrayana practice of Tonglen, which are you familiar with that? You invite in the darkness, breathe out the light, which is just the opposite of the New Age thing of breathe in the light, breathe out the darkness, mm -hmm. which is scattering garbage around the way. And I won't go. There. <laughs> breathe in the anger, breathe out love. So. Yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> I don't, I'm sorry, I don't mean to disparage any, anybody else's spiritual practice. <laughs> yes, sir. Did you find that your uh, public service, your public engagement, um, kind of takes you into a deeper level of the sorrows of the world? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, um, you open yourself to it. Yes, and that once you start giving people an opportunity to express themselves to you, you, you hear what they have. Yes, yeah. yes. And even if they can't articulate it as they're suffering, 
they may think that I'm the cause of their suffering. <laughs> and so then my job is to open my heart to their suffering, not try to shove it back on them, but say thank you. <laughs> Powerful yeah. practice. <laughs> <laughs> um, because of my friendship with uh, Lorinda Hartwell, I, I know you're a potter. Oh, uh, yeah. and evidently quite an exquisite one. Oh, when, <laughs> when when you are um, shaping, do you shape with these? Uh, do you work with this understanding that it's already broken? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> what is your? I I work with clay on the wheel, which is a practice of form and emptiness. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, um, I assume that it's always already broken. <laughs> and often it is. <laughs> and ultimately it is. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Hi. Um, thank you for your talk. You're I just wanted to um, respond to your previous statement about New Age-ness. Um <laughs> and in, in regards to equanimity, because I think it's a both and. I think that if you try to breathe in the darkness and you're not strong, if you have too much darkness inside you, you're not going to be able to turn that into light. So you've got to also have the time to practice bringing the light into you and letting the darkness out. Thank you for that reminder. That's, you're absolutely right. And the Tong Lang practice should not be taken lightly. And you you do it first by invoking all the protective deities and the bodhisattvas of compassion so that when you take it in you can transmute it into compassion and love and not poison yourself with it. Thank you for that, Rami. That's very important. Yeah. I think that's it. Thank you, Larry. You're very welcome. Thank you all. Um, Quickly, before we go into announcements, when I was setting up today, I found this piece of art here with GBF on it. And uh, did anybody know where that yes, came from? Yes, yes. It's by one of the uh, inmates that are newsletter. Wow. Ah, I think it's beautiful. Yes. I've never seen it before. Did everybody see it? Yeah. Just want to point that out. Greece has been pen palling with this particular man, incarcerated man, for some time now, and he said that. In, beautiful. Yeah. Absolutely beautiful. Yeah. I love it. Cool. Love it. And a picture's been taken of it on the altar and since sent back to him as well. So, yeah. Good energy there. Announcements. Um, so the book group is happening today for those who are reading Larry Yang's first half of the book, but we're continuing to read it, like the second half, so if people want to jump in, like um, the first of the month, first Sunday of the month is when we meet, and I don't know off the top of my head the date of the first Sunday of January, July, but if you're interested, we're, you know, the book isn't so big you can't read it in a whole month. Um, but look for email, you know, to the Yahoo group. People are invited to to jump in, you know, if they want to read the whole book. But wanted to announce that. You can also, also find it on iBooks as well. iBooks is yeah. oh yeah yeah. You can only have it in a book if you're like. Yeah. <laughs> um, also, there was a conversation that came up with a couple of us today about the mailing list. I think there's a lot of people who don't even know about the Yahoo group or sign the mailing list on the credenza, but nothing really happens necessarily with it. So I don't exactly know the procedure, but maybe someone could share that a little bit about there is a Yahoo group, how people can get on it, what the mailing list is for, like how communication goes out. Because I'm not sure everybody really is aware of how that all works or if it's really working necessarily. So, does anybody um, have any insights? Joe Castrovinci um, regularly takes the sign-up sheets out, out here mm -hmm. and then adds them to the list. Um, but anyone can go to the uh, Yahoo, the our, um, GBF site, and there's a, a link that will take you to Yahoo to make sure that you're on that list. From the, the website? Yeah, from the website. From the homepage. From the website homepage, there's a right. link to be able to get on the mailing emailing list for okay. The Yahoo list. It's not Yahoo. I find a nightmare. 
Um, but um, that's how it's set up. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. You'd have to set up a, a, an email address. But the Yahoo group, there is like weekly emails about who's speaking yeah. and retreat information as it comes yeah. up. And then others, kind of, people can always say, hey, this yeah. is happening. Right. Yeah. And if you have Gmail, it may be sending them to a, a promotion or a social um, folder. Yeah, yeah. And there's a Facebook website also. Yeah, there's a Facebook But as far as I know, the sign up sheet, if you put your name, address, whatever, it's really just for the, we have a GBF directory. So that's really what that's all about. It's never been taken any farther, I don't think. It doesn't go to the Yahoo group. No. You have to do the Yahoo group yourself. Right. Okay. You have to want it. You gotta want it. You gotta ask for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, because I'm trying to figure out how would how be an effective way to put out, if you want to be on the Yahoo group, because if everybody on the Yahoo group has already joined, but people who haven't can't, will not get that message from the Yahoo group, so. Karma. We need uh, an IT person to. We have a couple IT people who work with the board, uh, but I don't think Maybe Joe knows, knows because maybe yeah. Joe can, maybe he's put that into, yeah, since Mike, he does the directory, maybe we can send up in the directory. Michael probably knows, mm -hmm. Michael Murphy, but. Okay. Yeah. Any other announcements? Well, my name's Daniel, I'm the host this week. Um, it's my first time doing this. I'll try to remember all the announcements. The first one <laughs> is that I'll be walking around with the Donable after this for your um, generosity. Second one, um, cups, please wash them or leave them in the sink. 12.30, people may gather to go out to lunch. And the last one, as this whole conversation was about, uh, if you're new, there's a a sign-up sheet that now it's really not clear what that's for. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. I have a question. Does GBF do anything for Pride? I mean, I know we're meeting this. There's a you know Pride Falls Sunday, but does has there any been anything like? It's been a hourly. That's a long running discussion we had. Many years ago, we had a couple. Of, I even had the booths in my closet somewhere. But there has been enough interest to. Yeah, if you want to do it, I have a booth. All you got to do is just have the people assemble it. And, but but yeah, there has been a whole lot of enthusiastic response to that. And has there ever been any kind of public? the public said or something like that in well, the I don't maybe, center. Even the like public that. said that there has been a response to whatever the public said. So uh -huh. I was um, curious. Yeah. Uh, we've kind of fallen to the flabby of embrace of apathy on this one. So. <laughs> or non-action maybe. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Engaged non-action. Excited to think about it. Yeah, that's much nicer. Attraction, not promotion. It's a, yeah, for those of you who have Amazon Prime, there's a British comedy called Fleabag, which is among the most extraordinary things I've ever seen. Um, it is devastatingly funny. It is appalling and is totally worthwhile. And in the second season, it, it intersects with your spirituality. And it's, I've watched it a couple of times, and I'm profoundly moved by it. Called Fleabag. It's not a very presuming title, but um, it's one of the most raw and honest things I've ever seen. And very, very funny. I just figured, why not prolong this a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> I've, got a, I've got a plug. Uh, this week, uh, a film is mm -hmm. opening at the Metreon called The Last Black Man in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And it's by a young uh, San Franciscan uh, filmmaker who's who caught my attention when he made a student film when he was at Soda, and I've had him come and visit my class um, <clears throat> a few times as his career has been unfolding. And um, Last Black Man in San Francisco, um, it's a film about the changing, the, the displacement that is going on. Um, not only physically, but you know, soulfully uh, in San Francisco. 
and um, it premiered at Sundance and won best. He won best director, and it won the jury prize. It's it's beautifully photographed and uh, beautiful score, and um, uh, if you <clears throat> if you resonate with that you know, the whole kind of you know for me um, I uh, I'm so grateful that I can still live in San Francisco mm -hmm. and so my living in San Francisco is just filled with gratitude and distress you know <laughs> in equal measure and uh, this film I think captures mm -hmm. one little kind of little, so I highly recommend it. Anyone else? <laughs> <All right. laughs> Get the Our speaker next week is uh, Samuel Schindler, and you can read about him in your newsletter um, and or online, I suspect. If you're you want to say anything, Samuel, about next week? Well, I'm going to give a little bit of information on the Enneagram of one of the of how <clears throat> we can use it to be more connected to our hearts. We have an emotional habit that takes us away from our heart. So how can we live in more open contact uh, to the vulnerability of our hearts? Thank you. Right on. Perfect. I guess we can gather in a circle for the dedication here. <laughs> By the power and truth of this practice, may all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all be free from sorrow and the causes of sorrow. May all never be separated from the sacred happiness which is without sorrow. And may all live in equanimity, without too much attachment or too much aversion, believing in the equality of all that lives. Thank you for listening to the Gay Buddhist Forum. If you would like to hear several new talks per month and be notified of upcoming speakers so you can participate live, please subscribe to this podcast, like us on Facebook, and join our mailing list by visiting gaybuddhist.org. <laughs>